All right, welcome. It is day five, our final day. It's so sad, our final day of our virtual Natural Resource Management Academy. Uh, for those of you who've been here all week, uh, you've met me already, but we might have some new people today. So I am Lauren Traster. I am the 4-H Teen and Leadership Program Coordinator for UVM Extension. And with me today, who is my collaborator in this program, is Hannah Phelps. She's with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. So Hannah and I have both been so happy with how the week has been going. You all have, those of you that have been here all week, we just can't, we keep telling everybody how awesome you guys have been participating just with the questions that you've been asking and how engaged that you've been with our presenters. And that just makes us both really happy. So our last day, hopefully, we're gonna end strong. So I'm gonna start off with my screen share. All right, so you all know the drill. So find your chat and tell us who you are, where you're from, and today's question that we're gonna think long and hard about is if your <laughs> belly button was an actual button, what would happen when you push it? My favorite so, question. <laughs> yeah, this is Hannah. So we, we have Hannah to thank for this question. And so we're going to kind of see when you guys find your chat, who's going to start us off today? <laughs> Nothing's coming yet. Oh, now we're going fast and furious. Jack has a self-destruct button. And Sophia, oh, chocolate would instantly appear. Okay, that could be dangerous, Sophia. Uh, three Olivia, hours of energy, that's a good one. That is. Uh, Olivia one. says three hours of instant energy, like an energy boost. That's a good one to remember. I like that one. I do that too. Sprout yeah, Brin wings. Oh. Brenna says a candy dispenser. <laughs> Love that. That would be, again, very dangerous for me. Uh, Alex, our presenter, who you're going to meet, says instant dinosaur transformation. Nice, Alex. <laughs> KL, I do, oh, it's going by so fast. You get any of these, Hannah? Help me here. Yeah, Lillian so says, fast. Lillian says that if, um, when she pushed it, a baby animal would appear. Um, Jasmine says she'd be able to change shape. Oh, Jacob wants to shrink when he pushes it. I see Ang at wings. Angus has an activate hanger mode. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hannah Let's would become see. invisible. Ethan awesome. would change into being made of light. <laughs> you guys Haley are so would, creative. Haley would stop time. Oh, <laughs> Zan Xander would all the money would appear. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. I've seen a couple of invisibles, so that's a good oh. button. You just press Here it. Here it says instantly fall asleep. That's a good one. That I would also, Ooh. I would like energy and instantly falling asleep. So if we can find a way to combine those, that'd be my button. <laughs> I'm going back to, I like the candy dispenser idea where it's like, hmm, I could go for, remember yesterday I said, I'm a peanut M&M. So you just mm -hmm. hit your belly button, boop, get some peanut <laughs> M&Ms. <laughs> So I'm going to ask Hannah totally. right now to pop into the chat box. If anybody needs our closed captioning, so we're going to put that link right into the chat box. Just click on that. Um, keep introducing yourselves. I see Tobin just chimed in and it would emit life force. Everything would grow within a five foot radius. That's Very awesome. cool. So you guys are awesome. Love that one. And again, keep introducing yourselves. Um, remember, if you've been with us, you know that I'm going to ask you to rename yourself. Make sure that you have your first name and at the very least, at least your last initial um, or your full name, whatever you prefer. And if for some reason you are against um, putting your name in, then you just need to private chat me because again, Hannah and I do need an accurate list. I know many of you have been with us all week, so I will be putting um, uh, creating a certificate for you. So I, I just need to have that accurate list. And also we do want to be able to call you by name when you have a good comment or chat. So just go right ahead, find your name in the participant list, click on rename and go ahead and rename yourself right now. 
And I'll go over our other protocols for when we gather here in Zoom land. So we ask that you stay muted unless you raise your hand to talk. I mean, we do encourage you guys, if you want to share a comment or ask a question that way, please just, um, again, one of the options when you hover over your name um, or click on your name, there will be a choice to raise your hand. Otherwise, we use the chat box as a means to share our thoughts and questions. I know our presenter today is, is going to be asking you to respond a lot, so we'll do that through the chat box. Um, or again, raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Um, you all have been such a great group this year about being courteous and respectful. Um, just going to mention it again, just make sure that we um, are kind in this space and we're not creating any distractions so don't use the chat box unless it's related to our presentation and again you guys have been great all week I love it um, but try not to move around your house if you're on a device that you can walk around with just try to stay in one spot um, you are more than welcome to either have your video on or off that's your choice we do record these sessions um, just so you know, but you are not required to have your video on. That is your choice. Um, just stay engaged, participate fully, which you all have been doing. It has been so much fun because you guys have been really engaged this week. We love it. Um, so just want to remind you, I've done this the last few days, but we have some upcoming events. I would love to keep seeing you guys this summer. So come back to some of these other programs. Summer of Science meets every Wednesday, 1 to 2 o'clock. Next week, we have a great one on related to vet science and uh, zoonotic diseases and infectious disease as it relates to like animal-human transmission. Um, and we have a, we're going to August 12th. So it's every Wednesday till August 12th. Um, and then we'll even have, we'll, we'll start up the Science Cafe series again in September. So that's an ongoing thing although the, the time will change once school starts. Um, there's a great opportunity to, if you're into coding and robotics, um, we're looking to start first robotics teams all over the state, and we're looking for teams to be ambassadors of this program. So there's gonna be an information session on that on Monday, July 27th. So you can learn more by coming to that session. Um, you can sign up at the website that's listed right below. And I'm also seeking presentations for our Youth Environmental Summit. We always encourage young people to be presenters. Um, we have professionals who come and present, but we do like uh, youth to share work that they've done either with their school green team or on their own, or maybe it's just knowledge you have. I remember one year we had a team present about how eating meat um, and going vegetarian um, makes a, ch a difference as it relates to climate change. And so that was a topic that she is heavily involved with on a personal level. She goes around and testifies to it, legislatures. And I mean, she's, it's really impressive. She started at a very young age and she came and presented on that. So if this is something you might be interested in, you can um, put in a proposal to present uh, up until August 15th. So you can learn more again at this website that is listed. And I hope you all will consider participating in more of these programs because again, um, I, like, I like how engaged you all have been. So it would just be fun to have you around. So today, what we're going to do, because our presenter is going to be talking about international work that she's done. So Hannah and I thought it'd be really fun to find out what is the number one country you want to travel to? Um, and you can use the annotate feature. We're gonna do this two ways. If the annotate feature works for you, you can mark up on the map where you wanna go because we kinda of want a visual to see. And then in the chat box, tell us where you wanna go and why. And then if anybody wants to raise their hand to share, we'll call on you. But we'll just give it a little bit of time to let people mark up and write in the chat box. And then we'll see if anybody wants to share out. Oh, I love, I see people are finding the annotate feature. We've got Olivia saying she wants to go to, the, to Egypt for the monument and Ashton wants to go to Australia. Aaron wants to go to Siberia in Russia, more trees than Vermont. 
And Hannah wants to go to Italy because of the food and the scenery. Ooh, you guys are picking some good things. Let's see, Xander wants to go to Scotland and Ethan wants to go to Japan for the culture and the landscape. Nice. Where is so oh, Sophia says Sweden for skiing and amazing landscape. Ella, Cambodia to see the Angkor, I, what? I guess that's how you say it. Uh, Brenna, Ireland because of the ocean and the land. Uh, Angus wants to go to Scotland to visit family. And Lexi wants to go to Greece. Start popping up really fast. And I got lost. Okay, here, Sydney wants to go to Peru. And Aaron, New Zealand. And Tovin, remote Russia for the wilderness. Haley wants to go to Brazil and Siena, Mongolia or Italy. Very cool. Garrett, Nepal. Jack wants to go to Greenland. Daisy, Daisy wants to go to Italy. And Kale wants to go to New Zealand. Jasmine, Alaska. Oh my God, I want to go travel now. Jacob wants to go to Chile. And Lillian, I don't know, somewhere where there is wild horses. Oh my God, these are all fantastic. Does anybody want to raise their hand and and share a little bit more about their choice. Hannah, you'll have to tell me if anyone raised their yeah. hand. Oh, it looks like Lillian yeah. did. If you can unmute her. Yep. Working on it. Lillian, did you want to share? Yeah. So, first, I just wanted to say that I might have to get off a little bit earlier today for a camping trip. Okay. And I chose somewhere with wild horses because. I've always just loved the way horses look. And I feel like just seeing them in the wild would be like really breathtaking, breathtaking if I could find them. Mm -hmm. so, I will tell you, Lillian, there's an island in, I think it's- I've, I've heard about it. I just don't know the name of it or where it is. I think it's, I think it's South Carolina. I think it's like Sinatogue, Asitu, something like that. And if anyone knows and can help Lillian out. There, I know there are some in New England, there are some islands, and then there are parts of the Outer Banks in North Carolina where I'm from that also have wild horses. But you're gonna love, uh, part of my presentation is on Iceland and I've got a picture of a wild horse. It's perfect. Nice. You didn't even plan this. This is great. Would anyone else like to share? Well, I think you guys are going to be excited to just travel the world with our presenter today. I think, oh, Ashton, we'll let you. So, Brenna, uh, Brenna, Hannah will unmute you. Go ahead, Ashton. I want to go to Australia because I want to hold a fluffy koala. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That is why I want to go to Australia. Awesome. The wildlife in Australia is amazing. So I've never been. I'd love to go as well. And I but... want to see kangaroos. Mm -hmm. I really had a friend who lived in Australia. And I got to tell you, the people from Australia are some of the funniest, nicest. Like, I, I've never laughed so hard in my life when I, I met, because she ended up marrying someone from Australia and all his friends mm -hmm. came and just wonderful people. So... This is yeah. great. So you guys, I love that you have all of these ideas and hopefully today's presentation will inspire you um, to travel. So um, are you able to, oh, Hannah, I can get this. I got to clear the annotations. Hang on a second. We're not clearing. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, as you guys know, today's our last day. And um, if anyone's on who's missed any of the sessions, we have recorded all the sessions, so you can always go back and watch. But today's our final day. Um, again, very sad about that. And our final topic today 
is supporting communities and protecting nature, careers in international development and natural resource management. And Hannah is going to introduce our presenter. Yeah, awesome. So here to tell us all about that um, is Alex Niedermeyer. Um, she served in the Peace Corps in West Africa, where she worked with a women's community group on agribusiness and health. She then worked with the U.S. Forest Service International Programs based in Washington, D.C. on a forest management and climate change mitigation programs in the Congo Basin and, and in, um, in the Congo Basin in Central Africa. Sorry, I'm, my words are all mixed up today. Um, Alex is really excited to be starting a new position with Tetra Tech's AR. Tetra Tech ARD's environment and natural resources sector. Um, she's currently focused on the USAID funded greening prey laying project in Cambodia. So all kinds of really cool things that Alex has gotten to be a part of and hopefully she'll share some of these, this stuff with us today. So Alex, you can take it away. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. And I am so excited to be here. I'm just looking for my share button. Um, to share my presentation, which I don't see anymore. Uh, oh, there we go, got it. Let's see, share. And we're gonna go here. Thinking. There we go, does that look okay? Yep. Great. So hey everyone, I'm so excited to get to hang out with you today. I, I think all of you are in middle school and high school. That's great. I did some student teaching, so I love uh, working with middle schoolers and high schoolers and getting them excited about travel and about science. So um, I hope you'll ask lots of questions today. I have, um, you know, some materials here, but I'm ready to answer any of your questions you might have. So feel free to reach out and um, send a message every time, anytime you'd like. So uh, my presentation kind of um, focuses on communities and protecting nature. So as uh, I was presented, I have worked in a couple of different places and something that stood out to me is um, how important nature is to all these different communities in the world. So that'll be a theme for me today. So first of all, I would love to hear, um, and you can enter it in the chat box, if any of you have ideas of what future career you might be interested in. So it doesn't have to be you're sure about it, but maybe you're interested in being a wildlife biologist or um, a forest management person. Um, we have a forest so, ranger, says Sophia. Right. Probably. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Tovin says researcher or cybernetics. Uh, Dia says she wants to go into the medical field. Hannah would love to be a wildlife biologist or a marine biologist. Cool. Rina, some sort of animal scientist or vet. Ethan says nice. I want to be a forester. I skipped one because I see astrophysicist. Ella wants to be an astrophysicist. Kieran wants to be a wildland firefighter. Uh, Jasmine wants to be a falconer or a vet. Um, oh, I just lost my place. And I, <laughs> you might need to take over. Oh, no, there we go. Olivia says mathematician or computer science. Jacob, engineering mm -hmm. against climate change. Aston wants to be a professional football player. We'll root for you. As long as you're a New England team. <laughs> Uh, Jack wants to be a fantasy writer. Daisy wants to be a pharmacist or a radiologist. Claire wants to be an orthodontist and Lexi wants to be a nurse. Kate wants to be an environmental engineer. Lillian, Ooh. something to do with animals, an artist or ethereal. Sienna says biologist, paleontologist or something to do with horses. Megan, mm -hmm. studying what happens to our bodies when we die. Claire wants to be a professional skier, and Lillian says author. Oh my God, you guys, what Whoa. an amazing list. That's awesome. So many good things in there. Well, and Garrett Garrett just chimed in, orthodontist or dentist. Yes, keep your teeth Ooh. healthy. Yeah, it's very important. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, my career path today, and maybe it'll inspire some of you to 
take even more interest in the environment or at the very least uh, see some other natural places in the world and get involved with preserving our environment because we all know that is very important. Um, and then after I tell you about my career path, I'm also going to give you kind of a crash course in the world of international development and natural resource management in case that's something that you're interested in. And I'll have some time between all the sections to ask questions if anybody has any burning questions. So here we go. So the first step in my journey after where you all are is um, going to college at the University of North Carolina in Asheville. So I am from North Carolina and I grew up outside of Asheville. And um, this is Asheville here, this pretty picture of the city. And I majored in environmental studies and my focus was in geology. So I love rocks and I get very nerdy and excited about them. And I also worked on getting a license to teach high school science. Um, so as you probably hear from people all the time, things change in your career path. And at one point I actually wanted to be a high school art teacher. And then I changed my mind in my senior year and decided to get into environmental studies instead. So I also, um, many of you might also be thinking about how expensive college could be. And that was something that I thought about a lot and looked for scholarships. Um, and I found a scholarship called the Teaching Fellows of North Carolina. And that was great. I got to see a lot of parts of North Carolina and go visit different education systems and see how they work. And um, as you'll hear from other people, uh, the cost of college are, is pretty important. It's a hard decision to make and I'm sure you all will, that those of you that are interested in following that route will um, delve into that research. But uh, I am also happy to uh, talk to you all. You have my email address at the end if you ever have any questions about making decisions about getting into environmental studies. So, I love that you all mentioned Iceland, that's so perfect. It's like you were plants in the audience or, said, and, or something. So study abroad is something that a lot of colleges offer and it's a really great opportunity to spend a semester at another university. So um, I went to Iceland because like I said, I love rocks and geology and think it's really cool. So, uh, does anybody want to raise their hand that might have an idea of why a geologist would be interested in studying in Iceland? Does anybody have any ideas about that? Or if you're not wanting to say it out loud, maybe you can enter it in the, the chat box. Oh, I see someone has their hand raised. Oh, Cyrus. Um, maybe because there was a lot of rocks there. That is very true. There are a lot of rocks there. And I brought a lot home with me, like a whole suitcase. It was a little bit embarrassing. Some really cool rocks. So the reason Iceland... Oh, is someone else maybe having well, an we, idea? Oh, yes, we do. We have we some have, chat box. Well, we have Lillian and Aaron who both raise their hand. I'm going to do Lillian first. Okay, Lillian. So I was thinking that maybe because like a glacier had been there and had left like a lot of rocks that, that were is, old. Yes, you are between the both of you, you're right on the money. So the re the big reason I was so interested in studying abroad in Iceland and the reason geologists are so interested in it is that Iceland is along something called a rift zone. So you all might have heard about plate tectonics before. The most exciting part is um, this is where volcanoes sometimes get their energy and that's where the lava comes from, these rift zones. So there's plates all over our earth and in some places they're crashing together and in other places they're pulling apart. So in Iceland, it's really interesting because this is a plate, or the place where the North American plate and the Eurasian plate are pulling apart and so that's what you're seeing in this slide here. This big red line is where the two plates are pulling apart. And so that makes for some really interesting geology. And 
together with the fact that Iceland is pretty cold and has glaciers in different places, we get a lot of interesting interactions between volcanoes and glaciers. And I think that is so cool. So the picture that you're seeing on the right here, this is a, a place called Thingveller. And this is very important for Vikings that came to Iceland uh, almost a thousand years ago. This was a site where they would have their parliament, and it also happens to be the place where you can see this rift between the two uh, tectonic plates. So it's really interesting. So sometimes there's these long volcanoes called fissure volcanoes that stretch along this um, long place where the plates are pulling apart. So while I was there, I took lots of, um, had lots of interesting coursework on volcanology and glacier geology. And um, glaciers, as you all know, living, uh, some of you that live in Vermont might have seen this and other places in the northern part of the United States, glaciers are really important to what our landscapes look like. So in Iceland, um, they have, these beautiful places called fjords. And that's what you're seeing in this picture. This is a place where a tongue of a glacier was reaching out to the sea. And as the glacier receded, as the world warmed up, it carved out this deep um, dig into the um, seabed and made this beautiful ford. So you can, if you look back at this map, you can see the whole west part of Iceland has tons of fjords, these little cutout places where Iceland's or where glaciers receded a long time ago. Super cool. Uh, this is not Mordor for those of you that like the Lord of the Rings. This is actually a volcano in Iceland. And what you're seeing in front of it, this big field that's brown. So that's actually a lava field, an old lava field where um, lava was coming out of this volcano and spread all the way across this whole scene. And then the brown stuff on top is lichens and moss, which are really amazing pioneer species that can even make a home on top of these not very hospitable lava rocks after a volcanic eruption. And here you can see something called columnar jointing. So this is something that happens around lava fields, this blocky, basalt rock that you're seeing here and then the ocean has eroded away different parts of it um, where it's where the lava has met the sea. So lots of interesting formations all over the land. And then finally this is a really special place called Heime which is an island off of southern Iceland and in the middle here you see this volcano but you can see there's kind of an opening uh, in the middle and that's a very important port for Iceland where fishermen go out and where, you know, all of the um, different things that this island needs come into the island. It's a safe port. Uh, and several decades ago, the volcano erupted and it was threatening to close the port. And that would be very bad for the people that lived in Heime. So they took seawater and they poured it all over the lava to keep the port open and they kind of like fought the volcano. And so the port is still there. And actually this volcano is still active and you can climb to the top and dig a little bit down in the dirt and it feels very warm. So lots of neat places to visit in Iceland. It was a very good place to be a student. Uh, so this, another, you know, speaking of glaciers, this is a, a special glacier in Iceland that uh, sits on top of a volcano. And uh, part of it actually melted about 10 years ago because the volcano started to erupt. And that quickly melted the glacier and caused lots of steam and smoke and all kinds of other gross gases to go up into the atmosphere and cause lots of problems. Now you probably see all these weird letters in this name of the glacier. And I'm wondering if anybody wants to try to pronounce this glacier name. Does so anybody this, accept this one, your you're challenge? You're gonna have to raise your hand for this one. <laughs> no, no phonetic in the chat box. Uh, Lillian <laughs> is the first to give it a try. So I'm gonna unmute you, Lillian. All right, go ahead. 
Snaefels Joku. That was pretty close. Anybody right. else want to take We've a stab? Got Olivia, who Olivia D. Uh, I'm gonna unmute you. There you go. Um, Snaefels Joku. Woo! That was really close. You got the the J right. That's a little bit tricky. All right, Tovin has his hand up. He's going to give it a try. Tovin, I'm going right. to unmute you. Um, okay, so Nafel's your call. Oh, that was also really good. You guys are very close. All right, so this was very uh, fun. When have this... no other hands up. Anyone else want to give it a try? <laughs> Going once. No one to, oh, Aaron. Oh. All right, I'm going to unmute you, Aaron. There you go. What you think, Aaron? Aaron K, you are unmuted. Sorry, I my headphone microphone wasn't working. Um, oh. That is, you guys are. I think you're ready for an Icelandic speech and pronunciation class, which I took and I did really bad at, actually. Uh, so this is pronounced Snaifuk Jokul. So Icelandic has some interesting characters and letters in it. And this double L that you see is kind of interesting because you have to like, you have to like blow the air out between the sides of your teeth into the side of your mouth. So it's a very hard language to learn. This is like Old Norse. So this is what the Vikings spoke like a thousand years ago and it's pretty well preserved, but so, it was pretty okay. fun. Oh, Olivia is asking it. if you can say it one more time. Sure. So it's pronounced Snaifuk Jokul. And Jokul means glacier in Icelandic. So now you'll know if you look at a map of Iceland and you see that Jokul word somewhere, that means glacier. I will have to say if anybody wants is killing time on a rainy day, watch the show Welcome to Sweden. It was only around for one season. But this reminds me as an American who his wife is Swedish and he goes to live there and just the struggles with the language and, and a lot. It's, it's very funny just from that sort of like cultural immersion perspective of yes. very difficult language. <laughs> yes, very difficult language, but very interesting. Uh, and if anybody is interested also in things like fairies and, you know, kind of like magical mythical creatures, Iceland has a really fun relationship with those kinds of things. And so that's like an incentive to learn Icelandic. There's lots of stories and things like that. So that's just kind of a fun, the pronunciation of Snæfellsjökull Glacier. Um, and one interesting thing, um, you should all read more about glaciers, they're very interesting, but you'll see this little white cloud cap over the top of the glacier. And maybe some of you know, but glaciers actually create their own weather systems. So part of what you're seeing here is this glacier creating clouds on top. And then even though it's so sunny in this picture, it's still snowing on top of the glacier. So they do all kinds of amazing, interesting things. Another thing I encourage you to look up are glacier mice, which are not mammals. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> So here's another picture of a glacier and you can see it spilling down over the mountain and then it's sometimes pieces of the glacier calve, calve off and go into this little lagoon area here and then get ready for it. Here's me being a, a geologist in the field uh, and if anybody has done any field work you recognize this little yellow notebook here. You got to have your right in the rain. Um, those are like notebooks so that even if it rains out, your um, writing won't disappear. And I'm also wearing my traditional Icelandic sweater, which is an important part of the outfit in Iceland. And so this was in my glacial geology class where we would go out and we might draw um, this glacier and look at where the moraines are and different parts of it and um, see how far out it used to go a long time ago and where maybe if it's receding now. So that was a great experience. Hey, and Alex, then, to, yes. Tovin asked how glaciers sure. influence the weather. That's a great question. Um, 
so the weather, so you all might be familiar with this difference between weather and climate. And weather is kind of at one time and a local sort of idea and climate is about the whole world. So people are very interested in the effects of climate on glaciers, but glaciers also affect the climate. Um, they can have lots of effects on the ocean um, and the salinity of the ocean and that creates different, sometimes complex feedback systems that can make our world warmer or colder. And then those climate effects can then affect the weather, say if you live in Vermont or in Maine or wherever you might be. So that's a great question. Um, so this, this picture is um, me digging a deep soil sample in Iceland. So this is one of the things you look at with glaciers is um, they really churn up the soil and dig deep. They're heavy and big and they have big rivers underneath of them. Um, and glaciers are actually very dirty. Uh, if you ever look at one, they're not as pristine as you might think. And so that has big effects on the soil. So part of our class assignment was going to dig a deep pit and then see how the layers in the um, soil might change and what rocks might be there. And if they're rounded because they got beat up by the glacier or have scratches from the glacier on them and make some assessments. Okay, so Lillian is gonna love this picture. Here's your wild horse. So Iceland has wild ponies, which are the cutest. They are so adorable. And they're kind of like dogs. They're very friendly and they're really fuzzy, as you can see, so they can put up with the harsh weather in Iceland. And they will just walk right up to you like this one is to me and come say hello and let you scratch behind their ears. So Icelandic ponies, um, if you ever go to Iceland, you all can go check them out. But of course, I didn't just go to Iceland to study. I, you know, had to meet Icelandic ponies and go camping and learn about Vikings and learn about the culture of Iceland. So this is a great reason to, you know, for you all to think about taking opportunities to study abroad if you do go to um, decide you want to go the college route or to find other opportunities to travel to learn. Yeah, so questions about college or study abroad from anybody? Yeah, there's a question. Have you heard of Draken? Draken? I don't think I have. I'm not sure what that could be. Any other questions? Don't no problem if right not. Now. You can always ask more later if any come up. Oh, I hear Aaron's asking, is it expensive to study abroad? And then That's Sienna related, is it an extra fee to study abroad? And did you stay with a family while you were there? Oh, that's, these are both really good questions. I'm actually glad you said that because that was one of my notes to say and I forgot is um, I did not have very much money coming into college. So I was very um, cognizant of having to find some funding. And I will say there is a lot there. You can find a lot of funding out there, especially um, folks that are in science. Uh, you know, as I was studying geology and environmental studies and was interested in being a teacher, I actually, I applied for a lot of um, you know, fundings and scholarships, which takes time and a lot of effort, but I actually ended up getting more than I could have that semester and I turned down a scholarship. So you can definitely find funding for it, but you will have to do your work. And it's important to look at the cost because as we know in our world, uh, there are lots of people my age still paying their student loans. So it is a good idea to take a look and see how much those sorts of things cost, but you can do it. You can find things. Um, do you mind if I chime in here, Alex? A sure, lot of, yeah. A lot of schools will also, if you're on financial aid for the school, they'll also transfer that to a study abroad program. It depends on yes. your school and your program. Um, and then Sienna just was wondering where you stayed. Did you stay with a family or were you in a dorm or something else? Thank you. Yeah. So I did not stay with a family in Iceland, although that would have been super cool. Um, so I stayed in an international dorm, which was a whole different experience and was also a lot of fun. It was a big 
part of the reason my study abroad was so great is that I got to meet people from all over the world who were also into rocks in Iceland. Um, so people from Sweden and France and maybe from China, um, just all over the place. And we all got to kind of experience um, traveling in Iceland together. So, and uh, Kate, so mm -hmm. the question about did you go to Drake in? Um, oh. That's the reconstruction of the Viking ship that sailed to America. Cool. No, I didn't. Do. That sounds really neat. And apparently, it redid the feat recently. Oh, so that's cool. Everybody needs to go check out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This was my study abroad was a few years ago, and Iceland has done a lot more cool things. So I'm sure there's all kinds of other things to visit now. So if there's not any other questions, I'll um, move on to. There oh, is a there's... question. What is okay, the sure. thing in the picture? I, think oh. you're about to... <laughs> I didn't even say that. So this is just a statue that is in Reykjavik, which is the um, capital of Iceland. And it's just like an artistic representation of a- Hey, movie. Alex, I think something happened to your mic. You sound very far away. Did oh, you sorry move about it? That. Can you hear me better now? No? Okay, that's okay. Here, I'll just turn this off. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, so this is in the capital, Reykjavik, and this is like an artistic uh, interpretation of a Viking boat. The Vikings um, are some of the first people to have arrived in Iceland. Um, if there's not any other questions, I'll switch over um, to a whole different kind of it. So I go from cold and snowy, and now we're going to go really hot and sandy. So get ready. So after I finished college, I signed up for the Peace Corps, which might be something that you all are familiar with. Um, and so just some basics in case you've never heard of it before. I think you heard about AmeriCorps this week. So AmeriCorps is focused on the, um, like in the United States and Peace Corps is international. So Peace Corps works all over the world in tons of different countries that are often um, developing countries. And it's a two year, three month commitment. So sometimes that's kind of long for people. And it's mostly a cultural exchange. So you learn about the people that live in the place that you go. And then when you come back to the US, you tell people in the United States about the place that you lived and what the people are like. Um, and then uh, you get lots of language and technical training. So there's all different types of volunteers. You could be a health volunteer. Um, you could do more environment stuff. You could be agriculture. You could be education and teach like uh, English perhaps. Um, and uh, sometimes you're placed at a site where there may be another volunteer there from the Peace Corps with you. Or sometimes you're at a site and you're by yourself, which is what my situation was. Um, so I put in the links, which if there's any, or if any of you are interested in Peace Corps, there's a program called Peace Corps Prep. That's a college program that helps people prepare uh, to join the Peace Corps. I did not do that, but I've heard that it's a good program. So you all might be interested in that. And um, maybe fortunately or unfortunately, you do have to have a college degree for the Peace Corps. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. This is something you would do after college. Okay, so my Peace Corps service. So here's question number one for you. So you see that box with the one on it there. Does anybody know what country that is with a red outline? Uh, Sydney says Mali. A bunch of them say Mali. Ha! How did you guys know that? That was so good. Nice. All right. So what okay. about did anybody just Google that or you guys actually knew that? <laughs> <laughs> that would be some fast Googling. Okay, what about country two? 
What do you guys think country two is? We have Burkina Faso. You guys must have looked that up. I'm so impressive. Or maybe that was uh, Sydney, by the way. So nice. And, Sydney. and Sienna also came in with that. Nice. All right. That's great. I think the only shout out I ever see for Burkina Faso is it had an honorable mention in Harry Potter at one point. So maybe that's how you all heard of it. Um, so yes, that was Molly and this is Burkina Faso. So we are on the continent of Africa right now. For those of you that are not as familiar with it, I was not. I didn't know anything about either of these places before I started my Peace Corps service. So it's okay if you don't. And um, if you're not familiar with this part of the world, all this stuff in orange and yellow, that is all sand, that's a big desert. And then all this stuff in green below, it goes from sand, 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 and then it transitions. And then all the way down by Cameroon is tropical rainforest. So all kinds of, it's, it's a big place and there are all kinds of ecosystems there. So while I was in Peace Corps, I actually served in two countries. So first I served in Mali in a little town called Tumu. And Tumu in the language in Mali, which is Bambara, Tumu means like a, a little worm. So not a very charming town name. I don't know where it came from. Uh, and then I did Peace Corps in Burkina Faso and I served there in a village called Warkoi. And that doesn't have any specific meaning. That's just the name of the town. <laughs> so basically my service there, I was first an agricultural extension agent. So you might have heard of extension services for some of you that are interested in natural resources. That means you like work with um, maybe farmers, for example, and show them different ways that they can improve their crops or prevent pests. Um, and then in Burkina Faso, I was an agribusiness volunteer. And so that's like two words, right? Agriculture and business. So that's helping farmers sell their crops um, and maybe get some more money for them. And Alex, I'll just add, so there is an extension service tied in every state in the US. It's always tied to the land grant university, which is the University of Vermont. And I, as, the, as a 4-H staff person, work for extension because every extension has a youth development program, which is the 4-H program. So you all, if you want to go in the Peace Corps and get some extension, like knowledge, you could connect right to what's here in Vermont. Yes, and that sounds so fun. Extension is awesome. You get to like learn all kinds of cool things and then share it with people or work with kids or work with people that have been farmers for a long time and you get to continue to learn a lot. So. That's, that's great. I encourage you all to look into that more. Um, so yeah, I had, I was this volunteer, like an environment volunteer, but like in a lot of um, places that are still developing in the world, a lot of other things are still important and health is a big thing. So I ended up um, doing some health projects. I did a lot of gardening. I made tofu which sometimes people are surprised about, that tofu would be popular in West Africa. Um, and then also building latrines because that's an important people, thing that people need sometimes. So basically the great thing about Peace Corps though is you can kind of choose your own adventure. So you start your service, you arrive in country, you have three months of training where you learn the language and you learn technical skills and you learn about the culture. And then you move to your site. So a small village or sometimes a city somewhere. And, um, and then you start doing whatever work is relevant to where you are. So it might be education, it might be environment, it might be health, it just sort of depends on the needs of your community. So I could talk about Peace Corps all day long, but I'm just extracting a few themes here for you all that maybe would be interesting even to folks that are not necessarily into natural resource management in their future. I think you'll still see some interesting things here. So the first one is the promise of working with women, yay. Uh, the importance of fun of food, I love food and um, culture and natural resources. And those two things are very integrated in the world. 
so yeah, this, my service really, I learned about these different cultures and I kind of got a window into how other people live in the world, which makes it a really good experience. So this was my welcoming crew in Mali. So these ladies here with their sweet instruments. Um, so you can see these instruments made out of gourds with strings and they've got shaky things and they are getting down and it was a great welcome into the city. And women were really a special part of my service in Peace Corps. And women have um, a really important part of these communities. Um, so you all probably, you know, recognize how important women are in your own lives, like your moms, or maybe you have a sister, or you know, or you just know other women. But in developing countries, um, working with women is really important. And we talk a lot about something called gender roles, which might be something that you've heard before. But sometimes women in these countries have very defined responsibilities, and it can be really difficult sometimes to complete those responsibilities. For example, maybe they have to walk really far to a river to get water because there's not running water there. Or maybe they have to collect wood from a forest that's very far away, especially if they live in that desert part of West Africa that we looked at. So a big part of my service was working with these women and helping to make their responsibilities a little bit easier and finding ways to help them make some more money because getting money to women in developing countries is often very good for their children and very good for their communities. And a lot of research has shown that women in these countries really benefit the community, the whole community when they have some more income. So then food, so this is a great part. Um, so here's a question for you all. You see this lady on the right hand of your screen and she's got this goopy stuff on her hands. Does anybody know what that goopy stuff is? Eva says dough, question mark. Dough's a really good guess. <laughs> Lily says food. Uh, Olivia says tofu. Everyone's putting question marks, so they're not. I know. Uh, Santa right. says mealies. Mm -hmm. uh, Lexi also is guessing tofu. Tobin says processed maize for tortillas. Oh, that's a really great. It's not bad, but that it does look very similar to that. So, can I give it away now? There's not I any don't other see guesses. Anything. Oh, we have bread dough. Sage is guessing. Dough, good guess. Not bread dough, though. So, because you, what? She, oh, because you said it was food. I almost, it almost looks like she's dipping her hands in like wax and it's like a, um, like a treatment to, you know, like, like, your hands. like a beauty treatment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good guess. Um, it's similar to that. Not quite, though. So this is actually something called shea butter, which some of you might be familiar with. So shea butter is an important uh, commodity in West Africa. It comes from a shea tree. So there's little nuts on shea trees and it's a pretty long process. It sometimes takes several months to extract butter from it. And part of that process is grinding up the nuts and putting them in a big uh, bowl like this woman has and then you Beat it with your hands. So that's what she's doing right there. She's beating up this mash and then she'll put water in it and the butter will rise to the top and they'll take that off and refine it a few times. And then um, I encourage you all to look at your chocolate. Um, for those of you that maybe wear makeup already, you can look at your makeup, look at your lotions and you'll see shea butter is a pretty common ingredient. So. So that's what she's doing. Now you know how shea butter is made. Um, and this dish that I've got my hand in on the right, this is kind of a staple dinner of West Africa. So this stuff is called toe, this yellow stuff on the bottom. And it's kind of like grits, if you all have ever had grits before, which is like corn, whoever was talking about like the corn meal that you use to make tortillas, it's a little bit like that. 
So it's cornmeal that's mixed up and then you dip it in this sauce up here. You do eat with your hands as you can see. And so I took a piece of toe and I'm dipping it in the sauce and then the part that you don't see is when I put it in my mouth and it's delicious. Mm -hmm. So food is very important in West Africa and women spend a lot of time growing, cooking, drying, protecting the food, feeding the whole family. Families can be really big, so it's an all-day affair making dinner sometimes. So that's a lot of work for women. But it's also where you get, like as a volunteer, when I would hang out with women making food, I'd get all the good gossip in town. And it was a great time to get to know women and know what was important with them and the kids would hang out. So food is a really great way to connect uh, with people, as you all probably already know. So another important um, theme from my service was, yes, food is important, and so is culture and natural resources. So I hope you can see this fellow on a camel over here, and he's walking in front of, this is my hut my little hut palace in Mali. These three huts here belong to me. And this guy, his big bags that he's got on his camel, he's come down from the desert in Mali, down further south where I lived uh, during the dry season, and he's come to get grain. So he might have other things he can trade, like maybe he has some money, maybe he has beads, maybe he has something else special, and he's going to trade for grain to bring back to the north. So that's part of his, the cultural tradition of um, northern people is that they're nomadic, which means they move around looking for different resources. Can you a question? Yeah, um, Hannah's wondering if you get paid for being in the Peace Corps. That's a good question. So um, you don't get, it, it, you are technically a volunteer, but they, um, like they give you enough money for what you need to live um, in line with how people in the village you're staying live. So I probably made like five or five dollars a day or something while I was in the Peace Corps. Um, so not very much, but definitely enough for me to have everything that I need. And your community helps take care of you, uh, which is great. Um, and then they do give you a stipend at the end. That's about seven thousand dollars. That's like your readjustment allowance. So when you're leaving your Peace Corps service, you have some money to um, get, you know, situated back in the United States when you return. Do you question? also get, um, if you then go, like, go back to school afterwards, is, is there additional stipends for schooling? Yeah, yeah that's a great point. So um, there's a couple other financial benefits, especially for school. So you, um, can um what's the word you can wait to pay on your loans until the end of your service so you wouldn't have to pay student loans for example while you're in peace corps which is good um there are also some like for loan forgiveness programs which can be really helpful for people um and then there's also something called the coverdell program uh, that a lot of universities participate in um, where they'll give you financial uh help if you want to go to a master's program, for example, after you finish your service. It's not all universities, but there are a lot that are part of that program. Nice. Yeah. Other questions? Not at this time. Okay. Nothing in the chat yet. No problem. So yeah, here's an up close of this fellow on his camel. Doesn't he look so cool? Uh, I don't envy him. Camels are not very comfortable and seems they're not very nice either. So he seems like he's got his under control, which is good. So yeah, like I said, culture and natural resources are really important when you start to work with a community. You want to know um, why they, you know, what natural resources they use, like why they're using them, what times of years of year, whether women use some things and men use others. Maybe old people use some things that like younger people don't. Um, so just some examples of that in, in Mali and in Burkina, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see a guy with his fishing net and he is out on the river um, in this little skinny boat that he's somehow not turning over. I don't know how he does that. 
and he's finding fish. Um, so a few times a year, there's extra fish, and there's a lot of fish in the river. So that is good to know if you're trying to do work there. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see um, the, so this is a father and a son, and they've got these um, oxen or um, these cows in the in between them, and they're using the cows to help till the field so that they can do some planting. So that's important to know that not only do people eat the cows, for example, or use the milk, they're also using them for farming. Uh, in the lower right hand corner, you're seeing uh, these nuts, which are called cola nuts, and they're very important in the culture of West Africa. You give them as gifts when you go visit someone's house. Um, sometimes people give them to you as gifts. Sometimes they're used as payment. Um, old people really like them a lot. They're supposed to give you energy. So you'll see these lots of places in, um, in West Africa. But then also natural resources are important just for fun. Like these kids, it's hot. It was hot out and they were like, let's go play in the river. So they're jumping in the river. And so that's another way that um, natural resources are important to this community. It's just for fun and hanging out, having a good time. But you guys probably know in the places you live too. I'm sure there's places you like to go and sit outside in this hot weather. So health and environment is also important. So you can see one of my friends from uh, the village I lived in in Mali, he's using something called a tippy tap. So when you don't have running water, you have to get creative with how to wash your hands. So this is one way where you put water in this little bucket here and then you can use your foot to pour the water out so you can wash your hands. There's also these kids in the middle who are jumping on my bed jumping on my cot outside. It's okay, they were having a great time. And this thing that they're under, this big green thing, is a mosquito net. So um, I'm sure you all hate mosquitoes like me, and we really don't like them in West Africa because they also carry malaria, which is not a fun thing to get. It's a little bit like getting the flu there, but worse. Um, and so lots of people get it, maybe they get it every year, but then some people are more susceptible to getting really sick from it. So um, it's important to take care of the environment there and not have pools of water around so that there's less mosquitoes and thus less malaria. Um, and then of course, you know I care about food, like I said, so um, that's what food is available depends on what can grow in the place that you live. And so what you're seeing in this upper right hand corner is a cashew nut. I bet you didn't know cashews look like this before they get in a tin can and arrive in the grocery store. So th they have a little fruit on the top called a cashew apple. And then they're actually very poisonous if you ate it right now. It takes a lot of processing to make them into the tasty treat you get to have. So that's really important for kids like these guys who would hang out at my house in the lower right hand corner. They helped me plant a bunch of cashew trees and baobab trees and other trees that have tasty and healthy fruits. And so we had a little fun award of, they were really into like American dollars. So we had some paper dollars that they got paid for when they plant, helped me plant some trees. So any questions about Peace Corps or Mali or Burkina Faso or anything else about that? So you guys, just so you remember, this isn't the end of her presentation. She's going to do enough more on, on uh, career paths and international natural resource management. So you'll have time to ask other you know, questions again, but right now specific yeah. to the Peace Corps, Sophia is asking, did you learn any words in other languages? And Sienna wants to know what was your favorite thing while you saw while there? Oh my gosh, my favorite thing. What a hard question. I got to think about that one for a minute. Uh, the languages, yes. So in Mali, they speak a language called Bambara. Um, and uh, that language is spoken in other parts of West Africa too. Uh, but when I went to Burkina Faso, there are so many local languages there. There's like 63 of them. Can you imagine? 
So I couldn't learn all of them. I didn't try. So I learned French instead, which is what a lot of people um, in Burkina Faso speak. It's kind of a common language. So I, any of you that are interested in learning languages, I really support you. It's very useful. And you may think French, I don't know if that, how good an idea that is because doesn't, so many people speak Spanish in the United States. But many places um, in Africa, for example, speak French, and so it's a very useful language to learn as well. But there's tons of languages that are great to learn. So, favorite thing that I saw? I saw an elephant one time in Burkina Faso. That was really cool. There's not that many of them there, so it was pretty special. That'd be cool to see it. So, um, did you... Did you choose where you went or was it assigned where you went? And oh, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> so I did not get to choose um, where I went. However, and for some of you that may be like, oh, no, that's too scary. But you can um, now choose with Peace Corps where you go. So you apply to a specific program in a specific country. Um, and maybe you have language skills already for that country. So you have more options now. So that makes it kind of nice. And then how did you know uh, what were the important things that needed doing? I did not know, <laughs> which I think is important to acknowledge. So learn people, by doing. You learn by doing, but also I learned by asking. So mm -hmm. it's really important part of the process um, in Peace Corps and in any kind of international development work to ask a lot of questions when you're starting out um, because what I think is important isn't necessarily what people in that place think is important and they live there and it's and it's for them so it's important to uh, do a lot of good studying before you start so that's a great question so I, I spent almost three months just doing this doing that study and learning all about the place uh, I had moved to wow um did you get to ride a camel i did not ride a camel in peace corps but i took a trip to morocco afterwards and i did ride a camel and it was not as fun as i thought it was going to be sorry <laughs> what do you think the biggest difference is between study abroad and peace corps that's a good question um peace corps is longer it's um a little over two years uh, and also with study abroad, you would be going to like a university every day, you'd have classes, but Peace Corps, you're just in a village and you, um, you know, your work is what you choose to engage in. So you're not going to like a school every day. And if I could say, so study abroad is when you're still in college and it's part of your coursework. Whereas Peace Corps, you've already graduated college and it's more like a workforce development. You know, you're, you're actually working, you're, you're done with school. So that's one of the other big differences is it's while you're in school versus when you're out of school. Yes, yeah, exactly. Anything else? Nothing at the moment. So we should right. move on to the, the next slides. And again, you guys, you can keep asking questions. We'll get to them. Totally. Um, so now I'm just going to um, talk about some career paths in international natural resource management. Um, so there are all kinds of topics that whatever you're interested in, there's probably international development work that is focused on that. So I'm just going to talk about some natural resource management ones here. Um, so here's a few examples of soil conservation. If any of you are into soil, some people are very into soil. That could be something. Watershed management, how people get their water, wildlife trafficking. I heard someone is interested in, in wildlife. So it's also important, you know, you probably hear about like elephant tusks and things like that being traded illegally or elephants being hunted illegally. That's a very important part of international development work. There's agriculture, forest management, the climate change engineer, definitely something for you in international development. Um, pollution is important because that affects everybody in our world, right? So that's international development. Mining is, is very important. That can have lots of environmental consequences. So there's a lot of work in that. 
sustainable tourism. So there's lots of beautiful places in the world, but we have to visit them in a way that doesn't harm those places. So that's a whole career. Rangeland management, where the cows go, if they're being destructive in the places they're going, how people manage those areas. Um, fire management, anybody living out in the West, you know how important fire can be. That's true in other places in the world too. Um, women and youth, that's something I'm very interested in and something I work on in my current job as well. It's helping promote women and young people in the world. Uh, and climate finance is also very important. Climate change is expensive and it's a big commitment. So figuring out how places pay for that is very important. And then I know someone was interested in, um, you know, oceans and marine science, uh, so marine conservation generally is also getting to be an even even bigger part of international development. Is there a question? Yeah, so Aaron's asking, can people combine these sometimes like soil conservation and adaptive agriculture or like adaptive agriculture and women? You have got your master's thesis ready for you. I yeah. know, right? <laughs> I love it. Any of these things are totally um, are very related and almost all of them are totally related to each other. So yeah, you can combine them any way you're interested in. So I'm just gonna kind of like talk about a couple of these real quick, just to pique your interest in them. So wildlife conservation, I know some people were maybe interested in that. Uh, does anybody know what this device is? Can you enter it in the chat box? Device on the tree. What is that thing? A trail, a trail camera. camera, an infrared camera. Yeah. Camera, a game camera, a wildlife cam. Yes, yes, you got it. You're yeah, you're all right. It's so this is a um like a wildlife trap camera. This is not my specialty, so I'm talking outside of my field here. But um this is in a park in Tanzania, and you can see this camera, when animals um, or other things walk in front of it or there's movement in front of it, it takes short videos and pictures. Um, and this can be really useful if you're trying to decide whether sometimes if there's any wildlife left in certain areas, like whether there should be funding for it. Uh, so you can see this is the park where they've set up these wildlife cameras in Tanzania, which is in East Africa. And look at these people setting up the, they're putting this on the tree so the, the when the animals walk by, they'll get some pictures. And, oh, is there a question real quick? Uh, just what is your current job, which you can, oh, yes. you can let was, them know when, yeah. when it's time. Yeah, I know we're getting close to time also. So here's all the goodies they found with this. Look at this elephant, his tusk, he's just right in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. At dusk, and then there you can see all of them. There's all of these elephants, which is so great because if you don't even know if elephants are there, and then you get this picture, it's like, oh, good. So we need to do some work to conserve them. Um, here's another little creature coming up on the edge of the um, park, and then we got a monkey there. So yeah, wildlife conservation is definitely an important part of international development. Um, here's another one. Oh, another question. Sorry, I know I don't want to like. No, just a comment like, whoa, that's cool, says Olivia. And yeah. I totally agree. You, know, you all should, could get game cams just, you know, if you live anywhere where wildlife is around, like, you'd be surprised. I had a beautiful deer in my yard this morning and just, cool. you know, we know she lives around us. She's been raising her babies yeah. for years, but it's still always cool to see them. But yeah. we, no one's like, out we, there. We know people, sh people, we know animals show up all night long and I would love yeah. to know who's visiting our property at night. Yeah. <laughs> signs of it totally. all the time. Well, here's some less um, exciting species or animals perhaps, but this is actually on my international development um, path. I took kind of a little detour and I looked at invasive species management, which might be something that you all have heard about before. Um, so invasive species are like plants or animals that have sometimes moved into a new area um, and they're taking control and they're kind of keeping other native species from being able to be a part of the environment. Um, 
And so it's a whole field of science to figure out how to manage them. So there's chemical control, like you spray chemicals all over it uh, until whatever it is is no longer there. There's biological control, like if any of you have ever bought ladybugs to eat the aphids in your garden before. So you use the ladybugs to control the aphid population. Or um, in some places they do silviculture, which means they might chop down tree a tree that has lots of like little invasive insects all over it so that it doesn't get on the other trees. So this is what I studied at the University of Vermont, actually. So I did a master's program for two years. I got funding for it from the Forest Service, which was great. So I did not pay and I got a stipend and that is something that is available in a lot of science fields, I know, so that's something to look out for in y'all's future. And this is what my research was about, um, the hemlock woolly adelgid and finding ways to manage it. Um, this is a little insect that kills hemlock trees and we're trying to find ways to control it in the United States. Um, so that's what you're seeing here, these little hemlocks. And then I was looking at these flies from another part of the world that eat the hemlock woolly adelgid so that it doesn't kill the trees anymore. And look, I wrote a paper about it. This was my first ever publication. Very exciting. So this is something that you could do in the master's too. Is there a question that I saw? Uh, no, Aaron was just making a comment that there are invasive species pretty much everywhere. So if people want to look into it, in high school, they might be able to find volunteer opportunities around invasive yeah. species management, which is a great point, Erin. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, and a great way. Um, University of Vermont does a lot of work on that, so um, you can definitely find resources there if that's something that you're interested in. It was very interesting, so I encourage you all to explore further. Okay, so last, just super quickly, um, another interesting area or place that I'm interested in especially is ecosystem services. So this is like um, services that nature provides to us. So you can see all these benefits from nature. I'm sure all of you could think of a lot of them. But if we think about like bees, for example, I'm sure you've heard about how important bees are in pollinating all our plants for us. And if we didn't have bees, what would we do? I personally do not want to get out there with a brush and pollinate all the flowers myself. So I would say I would like to keep the bees around because you have to pay me like at least $15 an hour to do that and that seems pretty expensive. So that is an example of an ecosystem service. That's something that bees do for us that we need and sometimes you can even give that a financial value. So this is very important in international development as well if you decide that you're gonna build a building somewhere, um, maybe in Burkina Faso, but then you're gonna get rid of all the drinking water for people, hmm, that seems like a pretty, like there's a financial cost to that and a people's needs cost. So maybe we need to think about building that building there. Is there a question? Yes, yeah, Sienna's asking, how much of a problem can it be when someone releases a domestic animal uh, that is like two goldfish being released into a pond on a scale of one to ten. Hmm. So like maybe the goldfish weren't from that area. And so I'm, I'm thinking maybe that's what that person means. So it's like a new species. And I would say it so depends. It's really hard to give it a number. And that is another master's thesis topic for you mm -hmm. is evaluating how much damage that would be. You'd have to look at what animal, what other animals it might be eating, whether it, and that maybe that changes the vegetation, maybe that changes the salinity of, of the, like an estuary or something. There's been all kinds of effects. So very complex, good question. Yeah. And I know we're trying to wrap up here. So just uh, another like, so ecosystem services, so water scarcity, and maybe that there's some evidence that that could cause rioting in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's a, a kind of like an eco, we need the water to, um, you know, when people have what they need, maybe there's less rioting, just kind of an interesting idea. And then of course, everybody's interested in right now is COVID. And, um, there's a lot of research going on about how ecosystem degradation 
that can cause different creatures in the forest that no longer have a home to interact more with humans. And then that's where sometimes there's some zoonotic disease transfer. So maybe a way to prevent that is to preserve habitats and ecosystems so that those creatures with their cooties stay where they are supposed to be and they're not close to humans. And so Alice, I was telling these guys, we have a science cafe next Wednesday talking just about uh, all the you know, new diseases and how they jump from animals to humans. So that is a topic next week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, that's, that was perfect. She didn't even tell me to put this in here, but it was- I out. know, it's like I paid her to do that, you would think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll just run through this real quick. So basically in international resource management, there's, there's all kinds of different organizations um that you can see here you could do research you could be in academia you could be in the private sector government um and here are some examples so after the um, peace corps i worked for the u.s forest service international programs and i worked in the congo basin um, for a little over two years and then after my master's degree now i work for petra tech which is actually based in burlington um, something you all could check out. They do internships and that sort of thing sometimes that might be interesting for you. And that's where I work on the Cambodia program that we mentioned at the beginning during um, forest management and now in Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. So you Australian, New Zealand interested people that's kind of in the same neighborhood. Um, and that is, uh, that's in the private sector. So that's like a, a for-profit company, which is different than working for the government. So yeah, I just encourage you to think about what your career path might be um, and all the different directions that you could go. Uh, and there, you know, there's lots of key skills, working with other cultures, languages, being flexible, being willing um, to learn and sometimes make mistakes, but just to try things. And also the boring part of doing a lot of budgets and finance and Excel sometimes, which I still have to do. It's not all exciting adventures. Um, being a good researcher and a good writer is important and just learning, you know, learning new things. So yeah, if you don't have the skills, that's okay. I didn't, I didn't used to have them either, but there's lots of different things out there that you can do. Here's just a couple of different ones that I thought of. Um, all kinds of language acquisition programs, master's programs, community colleges, you can shadow people, do internships. Um, and then here's some fun things on the right. I didn't have any money to travel. So I did a program called the Help Exchange, helpx.net. And I worked in Puerto Rico for two months on farm and learned a lot about tropical agriculture. And I also worked as an au pair one summer in Spain just because I wanted to learn Spanish. So this um, website, which you can look at, you basically uh, pay to get there. So you buy your plane ticket, but then once you're there, your host kind of you know gives you a place to stay and food in exchange for working, say like three or four hours a day on their farm or Airbnb or um, bed and breakfast or maybe helping out with the kids or whatever it might be. So it's just a cheap way to get um, some international experience basically. So yeah, final takeaways are connect with others about things that you love that you just think are so cool and then stay in touch with those people because maybe you'll get to work together sometime or they'll know about a job that you might be good at or interested in. Um, you do have to think about money. College is expensive and travel is expensive, but there are ways to do things um, cheap. You just got to do some research, uh, experiment, try new things, figure out what you might be interested in, and then whatever you don't know, do some research, do some digging. That's great. Thank you so yes. much, Alex. So I want to let you guys know, um, we're, if you have questions for Alex, you can definitely put them in the chat box. But what we're going to do is we're going to do our feedback right now. And then I know Hannah has put together a really fun Kahoot trivia that we're going to end with. So the first thing I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to put up our poll. Today we actually have three questions. So our normal question 
um, rating, knowledge gained, one to five. And then there's two others thinking about what this whole week, um, if it contributed. So please um, take the poll. I've launched it already. And then um, don't leave yet because we want you to stick around for the rest. And Alex is going to be staying with us too. So but we're going to do this poll first. This one's really important because it's got the extra two questions for the week. And if for some reason you can't see the poll, you can put your answers in the chat, but just, um, Make it so I know question one, question two, question three. I'm gonna leave it open for about 30 more seconds and then we'll, and Alex, if you can unshare your screen, that would be helpful for me. So we want you all to stick around. We got a few more things to do. So I'm hoping a couple more of you are in the poll. I'm gonna leave it open for 30 more seconds. We'd like to have more of you um getting it done okay so i'm gonna end the poll right now thank you guys for doing that and what i would like you to do so we're gonna do a final chat blast for the week before we get to our before we get to our trivia which i know Hannah's been working hard on. So in the chat box, remember, don't hit send. I want you to respond to like, what was your favorite part of the Natural Resource Management Academy? Describe your experience this week, or what was the favorite thing that you learned? You can respond to any of that, but put it in the chat, just don't hit send yet. And when I tell you, we're gonna just blast it out all at once. So take about a minute to do that. And then we'll get to the trivia and we'll end with our lessons from geese, which sounds odd, but they do teach you a lot. So I'm gonna give you guys about a minute or so to get set up in the chat for our blast. What's your favorite thing? And, and, and don't say that you wish this was in person because we all know that. We, we all wish that we could have had our in-person out at Buck Lake. Um, what was your favorite part about this being in virtual, our presenters? Describe your experience or your favorite thing that you learned. And I'm gonna say, I can't see anybody in the mode that I'm in right now. So I'm gonna go on one, you're gonna hit send. So three, two, one. Woo! We got a good, and I, of course I saw right, up the, right off the bat, Alex, I love learning about the Peace Corps, this is Angus. That was awesome. Glad my eye cut there. So I appreciate you guys all putting this stuff in. It's really good feedback that we're able to just have for the program, as well as I share it with our presenters. Alex has shared some really good at-home activities, which I'm gonna email out tonight as well. It's, it's now gonna include all day one through five. And I've also included some other, um, some other uh, resources that I found. Um, and there's gonna be a link to a Google site because there's some stuff that I just downloaded and put it in. And so there, you know, you can take a look, see if anything interests you. The at home is just for your own learning to keep you um, moving on. So I'm gonna turn it over to Hannah right now. And I assume I need to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, Hannah I'm gonna has, need to share mine. Hannah um, so, yeah, before we get going on this, if it is almost 2.30, if you guys need to run out, we totally understand, but if yeah. you have time to stick around until the end, please do. Um, I'm going to send 
uh, link. I'm going to send it in the chat right now. Um, if you don't have the Kahoot app on your phone, it's totally fine. Go to that link that I just, well, it didn't really hyperlink, but you can just type it into your browser. It's just kahoot.it. Um, and then it's going to ask you for a game code. And I just put the game code in the chat as well. If you guys don't want to play trivia, it's totally fine. But do this if you want to. Um, and if you don't want to actually answer the questions, you can just watch it progress. But I will be able to see when people enter the game. So I'll give you some time to get entered on that. Um, and then we'll go from there. You don't need to use your real full names for this. It's whatever you guys want. Um, so, so whatever, whatever works. All right, I'll give you guys another minute to get all set up. All right, if you need more time, can you put in the chat that you need more time? Otherwise, I'm going to give you 20 more seconds, then we're going to go. Okay, we'll wait a little longer, Lily. <laughs> you guys are coming up with some great nicknames for yourselves. Oh, I haven't gotten it. Now I got to go. I mean, I'm not playing, but now you've got me curious about the nicknames. I can start sharing my screen so we can look at them all. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not playing because I, I have a feeling Hannah maybe made the questions hard. I don't know. I, I think you guys will get them. But you guys are but, so right that. All right. Is oh, this yeah. Big boy. Yeah. The great. Nice. <laughs> Okay, I see that Lily got in. Does anyone else need more time? I can't see the chat right now. I can see the chat now. I, I think we're good. Okay, I'm gonna start then. So how this is gonna work, you guys, is the questions and the answers will show up on my screen share, and then you choose the, the color corresponding to the answer. So it'll have a red, a blue, an orange and a green option, and you choose whichever one is right. Um, I made the questions kind of, I made the time frame kind of long for the questions because the answers are kind of long, but we're just gonna get going and we'll see what happens. So um, it has 15 questions, so it's all from all week. So if you didn't, if you weren't here for a presentation. So the first one says, how did passenger pigeons significantly change the makeup of forests prior to European settlement? So your red option is flocks ate all the vegetation in the area, slowing forest growth. Your blue option is huge nesting flocks broke branches, opening up patches in the forest. Um, your orange option is flocks would nest in the understory, maintaining old growth forests. And green would be passenger pigeons did not significantly change the forest. So go ahead and submit your answers. And if you don't know, you can just guess one. Um, and then once everyone's submitted, it'll move on or in 30 more seconds. All right, this is all the way from Monday, so you guys might have to think hard about these first few. <laughs> so how did passenger pigeons significantly change the makeup of forests prior to European settlements? Oh. Three. Yeah, Lily, if you're having trouble, it's great. Just play in the chat box. That works too. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Most of you guys got this one right. So um, Kim talked to us about how they would all come in in huge flocks and they would sit on the branches and nest and then they would break up branches and open up patches for new forest to grow. So awesome. All right. So it gives us the standings after every question. So you guys are doing great. All right, what was a main cause, one of the main causes in the decline of amphibians, moose, fish, and other aquatic animals in the 1800s? So did those populations decline? Your red option is their habits were being, or their habitats were being developed into parking lots. Uh, your blue options is Europeans wiped out the beaver population, which reduced wetland habitat. Your orange option is beaver populations exploded and they took over the wetland hab habitat. 
or um, your green option is all aquatic animals were sought after and over harvested by the Europeans. So what caused all of these aquatic animals to decline in the 1800s? Cool, so almost all of you answered. If you don't know, you can just guess or think back to Monday. Three, two, one. All right, yeah, got, you guys got it. Most of you got it again. Um, so the Europeans wiped out the beaver population, which meant beavers weren't damming streams, and they weren't creating wetland habitats. So then the wetland habitat was reduced and a lot of other uh, animals were um, suffering from that. So awesome. I actually might've just given away the next question. Oh yeah, so why did the beaver decline have such a huge impact on other aquatic animals? Was it because the red option is beavers befriended and protected the other animals? Or the blue option is once beavers were gone, there were no, there was no more hap, there was more habitat for other animals. Your orange is beavers are a keystone species, or your green is beavers harvest. Beaver harvest resulted in aquatic animals being harvested too. So I kind of gave it away, but not quite, because there was a fun, fun thing we talked about with Kim. So awesome. 25 more seconds, think back to Monday or take a good guess. All right, we're almost there. Two, one. And yeah, beavers are a keystone. Wow, almost all of you got that one right. Good job. Beavers are a keystone species. So that means that they create habitat for other animals. Awesome. Cool. So here's our standings. Oop. All right. So unlike wetland users, which two animals thrived in Vermont in the 1800s? Was it red option is bobcat and fox? Blue option is catamount and wolf? Orange option is beaver and muskrat? and a uh, green option is coyote and fisher. So which two animals did really, really well in the 1800s, unlike all of the animals we just talked about? This is the last question from Monday. <laughs> all right, we're almost there. Couple more answers. You guys have 15 seconds. Which two animals did really well in the 1800s? All right. And there's a wider spread on this one. It was the bobcat and fox. It was those middle predators that once the big predators got taken out by Europeans, they were able to really thrive in that middle zone. Good job, you guys. Here's our standings. Oh, Sienna's back in the lead. All right. So what characterizes an old growth forest? Is that a forest with trees where all the trees are older than 150 years old? Is it a forest that grew among heavy disturbances? Is it a forest that has no understory at all? Or is it a forest that developed with minimal disturbances and has a lot of old trees, but they're not all super old? Those, sorry, so the, it was red, blue, orange, green was the order I gave them, and I forgot to say the colors that time. They're on the screen so you guys can cross-reference. All right, we have a few more answers. 15 more seconds. You guys want to get your answers in? What? We talked about this on Tuesday with Ethan. What makes an old growth forest? Two, one. All right, good job, you guys. Yep, it's one that has minimal disturbance but has a lot of old trees, um, but not all of them are super old. Cool, oh, I skipped the standings, but. Which methods inspired forest management today? 
Is it the methods that were used during the Industrial Revolution? That's your red choice. The blue choice is the methods that are used by, used by settlers in the 1800s. The orange cho choice is the methods that are naturally used by old growth forests. Or the green choice is each forester gets to make up his own methods and standards and do whatever they want. So wh what does a forester look at when they're deciding how to manage a forest? Which, which of these do they think about? This is also from Tuesday. Twenty more seconds. All right. We only have seventeen answers in. You guys have eight seconds to get your answers in. You can do it. All right. Two, one. And awesome, guys. So the, those they base them off of what um, old growth forests naturally do. Good job. Mm -hmm. All right, so what is a watershed? This is from Wednesday. So is it, red choice is an area of land where all the water drains into the same place. The blue choice is a single lake, pond, or river. The orange choice is the pipes that carry water into our houses. Or the green choice is a cliff face where runoff water is shed off a mountainside. Awesome, we got 16 answers. Let's get all those answers in. We got 30 more seconds. I think we might have some people dropping out as we go. So we'll just, we'll just keep going. All right. We have definitely had some people that needed to go and we do understand we're running late. I love that you all are playing. Um, this is great, but obviously if anyone does need to leave, like you feel free. But mm -hmm. for those that want to stick around and show off your knowledge, this is great. <laughs> awesome. Great. Good job, you guys. Yep. So an area of land where all the water drains into the same place. Cool. Here's our scoreboard. All right. What nutrient is a key stressor for Lake Champlain? So it's bad for Lake Champlain. Well, currently it's a key stressor so red choice is nitrogen blue choice is sulfur orange choice is chlorine and green choice is phosphorus those aren't all nutrients i just realized but <laughs> all right got 17 answers i'm gonna see what happens if we do this awesome so um i think that there's 17 of us playing because it's been 17 answers for the last three so once we get to 17 i'm gonna skip ahead that way we can go a little quicker um, so yeah, phosphorus. Phosphorus is, is doing a lot of damage in Lake Champlain right now. Awesome. So what's one thing that you can do to combat phosphorus levels in Lake Champlain to help lower those? Red is throw your dog's poop directly into the lake. Blue is leave your grass longer than three inches when you mow it. Orange is let your cows wade through willy-nilly in the Winooski River. Um, and green is add plant food to the water to help the aquatic plants grow better. 15, two more, you guys gonna throw them in there? 16, awesome, we're just waiting on one. All right, there's 17. Great, good job, you guys. Yeah, so leave your grass longer than three inches when you mow it, because that'll help filter out those nutrients, right? Awesome. Good job. All right, what is citizen science? This is from yesterday. So is red, public involvement in the collection of scientific data. Blue, research done by scientists who are also US citizens. Orange is experiments done on US citizens and green is scientific data that is only available to U.S. citizens. All right, just a couple more. There you go, you guys got this one fast. Awesome, and you all got it right, great job. Um, yeah, so it's public involvement in the collection of scientific data, great. Awesome. All right, what is iNaturalist used to record? When do you use it? Red, it's to record fun selfies with your friends. Blue, it's to record pictures of lost pets. Orange, it's to record observations and locations of wild species. Or green, it's to record all of your best gardening tips and tricks. 
All right, you had to have this one quick too. It's because we're getting, yeah, and all right. I think that most of us were here yesterday, huh? So observations and locations of wild species. Good job, you guys. There's a couple more. All right. What two pieces of information can help you and the iNaturalist AI correctly identify the species in your photo? So is it read the suggested species is recorded frequently and it's visually similar to your picture? Um, blue, the suggested species is visually similar to your picture and it has been seen nearby. Uh, orange is it's captive and cultivated. And green is this species has the same leaf shape and tooth size as your picture. So how do you, how does the AI narrow down what suggestions to give you? At 14. All right, a few more seconds. Awesome. There we go. Good job. So, so yeah, that was tricky. So it's um, not the, the frequency that it's been recorded, but where, if it's been nearby and if it's similar to the way your picture looks. Good job, you guys. That one was tricky. All right. I think we're on to today's questions. Let's see. All right. What two features of Iceland created its interesting geology? Was it desert and rainforest in the red choice? Um, blue is ponies and Vikings. Orange is fjords and ships, and green is glaciers and volcanoes. Hopefully, we all remember this one. It was <laughs> earlier today. A couple more answers. Awesome. Good job. Um, yeah, the ponies and Vikings, I would love that to have shaped the geology, but it was glaciers and volcanoes. Good job, you guys. <laughs> awesome. All right, what are ecosystem services? We touched on this at the end there. So red is various functions of natural systems or animals that benefits humans in some way. Blue is things that humans can do to help the ecosystem stay healthy. Orange is scientific methods to improve ecosystems that aren't healthy anymore. Or green is ecosystem, functions of ecosystems that benefit the wildlife that inhabits them. Great, there's our 17. Good job. Yeah, we only touched on this really briefly, um, and I was making these questions fast, but it's it's the way ecosystem services benefit humans. So it's the way nature benefits humans rather than the other way around. Good job, you guys. All right, and one more question. <laughs> Which of the following is not an aspect of invasive species management that we talked about? So red is chemical control, blue is silviculture, orange is water control and green is biological control so there were three things that we talked about being a part of invasive species management and one of those things is not what we talked about so which one is wrong awesome um great so yeah water control is not a part of it but chemical control silviculture and biological control so here's our podium awesome so that's third place, second place, Olivia D, and first place. Oh, you get a spotlight. That's exciting. Wow. Yay. You got Good all job, you the questions right. <laughs> Woohoo. Now, um, if, but if two people got 15 out of 15, how do they have um, different scores? I think they do it on, based on time, so how quickly you get the right answer as uh, well. I'm not sure. It, this is my no, first time using this platform. That's what Erin's saying in the chat box. So. That was awesome, you guys. Well done. Um, I just want to, for those of you that are still with us, that is actually not what I want to share. Um, I wanted to just end today with some lessons that we can learn from geese. So this is usually a story I share when I do leadership workshops, but geese are pretty cool in that when they fly, they fly in a V formation and each bird flaps its wings and they provide lift and assistance to go forward and those that are working up front work harder than the ones in the back and they rotate and take turns and i love this lesson also as it relates to natural resource management academy because all of you are hopefully thinking and i i go back to thinking about the first day and the quotes that you guys picked and identified with and all wanting to protect our environment and make a difference doing natural resource management and the thing is you can't do it alone you're going to be a, a part of something bigger a bigger effort 
And so the lessons that we learn from geese are lessons that can apply to natural resource management as well. The people that are working to, to protect our natural resources, to protect our environment. So share common direction and a sense of community, um, taking turns to do the hard work and sharing that leadership and making sure that that honking is encouraging and not something less helpful. So be like geese, you know, work together um, and, and make a difference. Um, because that's really, you know, as we learned from the Lorax, um, unless someone like you cares a, a whole lot, nothing's gonna change. And I didn't quote the Lorax perfectly, but we all know <laughs> the sentiments of the Lorax. So let's all take what we learned this week um, let's continue our learning as it relates to natural resource management, as it relates to environmental protection. Let's build our leadership skills and let's make a difference. And Sienna says, aren't geese kind of mean though? You know, maybe to you, but as they work together. And so they're honking. We have to think about when they're, when you take what they're doing as coming off as mean, all they're probably doing is protecting one of their members. So we can take our lessons from geese um, and let's all just try to find ways to continue learning. Um, and so as you guys move through your schooling and get out into the world like Alex has done, think about ways that you can contribute and be part of the group effort. So with that, we're gonna say goodbye. We're gonna thank you all for coming. And we hope to see you all again somewhere down the line. So thank you, everybody. Bye, guys.